everybody, good morning. Welcome to Alabama EMS Challenge. Uh, we'll be getting started here with Dr. Ferguson. I want to take a minute to thank the Alabama Fire College for sponsoring Alabama EMS Challenge. And today we're being hosted by Aniston Fire Department. We're coming to you from the Aniston Regional Training Center. And uh, take it away, Dr. Berg. All right. Mic's on. Can't hear me. Just let me know. All right. Thanks for coming out, guys. I appreciate it. We'll get started. Um, appreciate the East Region that's come out this way. Appreciate the Fire College sponsoring us to bring us out on the road. Uh, the goal this morning, we got lectures 9 to 11, then we're still doing skills at 1 o'clock uh, if you want to come out with ARC right now. So uh, this morning, we're going to talk uh, about uh, some a uh, couple of STEMI cases, a few EKGs, and then a trauma case. And then we'll take a break for a few minutes, and Dr. Evans will talk about some wilderness environmental emergencies as well. So for those that have been on before and seen the EMS Challenge, it's kind of redundant. For those that have not, EMS Challenge was started back in 2014 to bring physician-led Con Ed out to the community. Uh, so that's the goal of this. So we're trying to bring ER docs out, get more involved in EMS uh, through our uh, residency program at UAB. For you Con Ed, uh, Chief Ward will put a link up in the chat box, um, or you can also email alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com for your certificate today. Remember, National Registry has waived all requirements uh, for this year, so you can uh, do live or watch this on our YouTube channel later and get the same Con Ed for this cycle. That will probably change for 2021 or 2022, I mean, uh, but for now, that is still good to go. Um, updates, remember COVID is still here, numbers are going up. Nothing has changed by the state as far as our regulations, appropriate PPE and work uh, return to work. Remember for those that are uh, entering patients in the trauma or stroke system outside of BRIMS, do that early on. Uh, if you're using the STEMI system in the BRIMS region, uh, remember early system entry is very important. And the other issue we got is for places that have more than one hospital in the area, there are a lot of wall time issues due to COVID. Uh, we'll talk about this next time as well, but the key to that is be nice to each other, uh, both the ER staff and EMS, uh, we got patients to take care of. Opportunities will be uh, in Foley in January, in Springville in February, Prattville in March, and then uh, moving on from there, we'll look at the schedule. And we're still at Center Point Fire Department uh, live and online the second Wednesday of each month back in January. The year schedule will put out pretty soon. So a quick review of some things real quick about ketamine use. Uh, still seeing some issues with this. When you think about ketamine, it's in the protocols for altered mental status, but it's really more in the protocol for excited delirium or agitation. Uh, so the 84 year old lady from the nursing home who was a little bit confused, clawing at you, yelling, screaming, probably does not need ketamine uh, versus the, uh, the guy that is uh, extremely agitated that does. Um, we use ketamine for excited delirium. That'd probably be a better phrase than altered mental status. Excited delirium is the guy who's tripping out really hard on something. He's the guy who's naked dancing in the street. It takes, you know, four firemen, two policemen to hold him down. Those folks, ketamine is a great drug. It keeps the patient safe and it keeps you safe. And that's more excited delirium than altered mental status. Status. When you think about excited delirium, there are a lot of causes. I won't go into deep detail with this lecture. Uh, things that you think about right off the bat is acute psychosis, the schizophrenic or the person who's bipolar or manic off the medications and is a threat to themselves or you. Uh, the guy who's highly intoxicated with either alcohol or cocaine or spice or synthetic drugs. Those folks are high risk to get hurt. The American College of Physicians, the uh, uh, Nurses Association, law enforcement will all agree that it's better to chemically sedate these people than try to retain, uh, restrain them. It's a lot safer for those folks. So ketamine should be used for altered mental status. The state says you can use it for pain control as well. That's reasonable as long as your offline medical director approves it. If you're working with me, I'm not a big fan of ketamine for pain. Um, as long as you got fentanyl or morphine or something else to use. The other thing to think about with ketamine is based on ideal body weight, something that was never really taught in medical school versus actual body weight or total body weight. There are a lot of formulas out there, pretty confusing, but the gist of this is when you think about ketamine, it's really length based or weight based like adults. So if the guy's the same height and he's 200 pounds or 100 pounds, he gets the same dose. It's all based upon height. So picture to your right, they get different doses. Pictures to your left, they get the same dose. The problem with that is that ketamine is relatively safe unless you give too much, and then you have some airway issues. So the way I kind of think about dosing for the ketamine is I basically kind of mix all those other equations together and make it pretty simple. 
I say if somebody's five foot tall, come 52 kilograms if they're male, 50 if they're female, and then it's two kilograms per inch taller. So if you know how tall you are, you calculate your dose, and from that point on, you use that as a guesstimate for the patients you're taking care of. If the guy's taller than you, he gets a little bit more than you. If the guy's shorter than you, he gets a little bit less than you. Don't worry about absolute weight. It'll bite you at some point in the future if you do. For example, I got a guy that's five foot two or five foot six, 350 pounds. That's 160 kilograms. If we did our dose for excited delirium, four times 160, I have to break out a calculator and do that kind of math, right? But if you pop it up more than one vial, that's a red flag, too much ketamine, okay? If you do the ideal body weight, you say he's five foot six, so he's about 50 to 52 kilograms, and six times two is 12, add it to 50, then do you times four, you got about 256 milligrams. So it's a big freaking difference in the dosing there, right? Big freaking difference, okay? Uh, and the problem with this is you give somebody 640 milligrams of ketamine, yes, they will no longer be crazy. They will quit moving, all right? But they'll also go apneic, probably buy a tube, and a longer stay in the hospital, a lot of issues with that. So ketamine, remember, it's ideal body weight, not total body weight. The other thing if you want to do, if you're just too tired, you don't want to do math, was do four mg per kilo on the patient by the guesstimated weight, then cut the dose in half instead if you're using total body weight. The goal is to make them chillax so you can manage them and get them to the hospital without them kicking your butt or the policeman's butt or hurting themselves. The goal is not to snow them to the point that they buy an ICU bed at the hospital. Post-ketamine, remember the uh, only big issue with ketamine is people become apneic. So post-ketamine, patients are critical patients. So if you have a guy that's uh, excited delirium, butt naked, running around the house, law enforcement catches him, ties him down, you sedate him, once you get him rolled over on your stretcher, you expose him, look for life threats, cut his clothes off, you get an AccuCheck, look for a glucose, you're looking for patches for holes, things that kill people, and then he goes on the cardiac monitor and the SAT monitor. If you're lucky enough to work at a place that has entitled capnography, use that. If you don't, SAT is fine. The problem I see is that when people start to desat post-ketamine, so guy is now calm, relaxed, his SATs go from 99% to 90 to 78 mistake people make is they put oxygen on that person. This person does not need oxygen. Ketamine does not make you hypoxic and makes you not breathe. So if you're not breathing, you need more than oxygen. These guys need a jaw thrust. If that doesn't work, a nasal trumpet is great. If that doesn't work, a quick sternal rub, okay? If that doesn't work, maybe an OPA, high flow O2, and ventilate them. You cannot just put oxygen on people who are hypoxic post-ketamine. So there's a lot of data out there about passive oxygenation. We'll talk about that in the pit crew CPR this afternoon. But if you take somebody, uh, for example, when we do a brain death exam in the hospital, we have somebody that's on a ventilator, we take them off the vent, they're still intubated, we put oxygen tubing down the ET tube, crank it up to high flow. And you watch that person, they won't breathe for six, eight or 10 minutes and their sats are fine. Their CO2 builds up, they eventually become bradycardic, they go into cardiac arrest, but their O2 sats stay fine. Same theory with this. If somebody's giving ketamine, they're not breathing, you put oxygen on them, their SATs will stay up, okay? So you cannot treat hypoxia post-ketamine with oxygen initially. They need airway management, okay? If that doesn't work, okay, then O2 and bag them. If you have to intubate them, no harm, no foul. I'll give them folks as low as 50 mg of ketamine before the trauma bay, all right? For sedation, for a procedure, they quit breathing. No harm, no foul. I recognize it, I ventilate them, I intubate them. Same thing with you guys, y'all can do that. The thing that bites you is if you don't recognize the fact they're hypoxic because they're not breathing and you don't manage that airway, people die from that. So ketamine's a great drug. There's some hospitals I work in the state that is an ER physician, I can't get ketamine in the ER. So I'm very glad that we have it in the field. Just be wise with it, okay? All right, that's enough of that, sorry, rambling. So let's talk about 12 leads. I know, uh, Back on. Sorry. Still on? Cool. So, so we're doing a lot of uh, 12 lead uh, interpretation here. We're going to break it down and just do it probably once a month from this point on. Okay. Uh, so, if you're watching and 
the uh, 12 leads are not exciting to you. No harm, no foul. Take a break for a second. All right. Uh, but we still got to push these things out there. Very important that we interpret these things. The machines that read our 12 leads are about 70% accurate in my opinion. The manufacturer says they're 90%. I disagree. I got some EKGs I'll show you that are mistaken. Interpretations by the machine. Uh, so we've got to be able to read 12 leads, guys. Very important for our patients. It's one of the things we can actually intervene on for STEMIs. We can make a big difference, save a life with that. So when I look at 12 leads, I make it pretty simple. It's a screen too. I look at them and say, is the rate too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? I really like American Heart's too fast algorithm, wide or narrow, regular or regular, and the path where they go down, I think is excellent. But too slow, I think of three things. I think they're drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia. Everything else that makes somebody get bradycardic, you pick up in your primary exam. So the dude that's been shot in the chest, <clears throat> Heart rate of 140, blood pressure 90, you head into the hospital, and now his heart rate 70, 60, 40. We know what his problem is, right? His volume loss or attention pneumothorax, okay? So we pick that up in the primary exam. Things we don't pick up will be drugs, electrolyte, ischemia, and I can show you some ways in the 12 lead to pick those things up. And then okayish, that's the most uh, common thing we're going to see. I think about rates between 50 and 140, the rate's okayish. But is it scary or not scary? Is it an overdose, a TCA? Is it a STEMI? Is there infection? Things like that. And those are things you can pick up from an EKG. So that's why it's so important to look at these things a lot. You got to know the rate. You can't just use the machine to calculate it. I use the box method when I'm looking at the paper. I say first box to next box is 300, then 150, 100. If I get to about seven boxes, my mind's already kind of wasted away with my ADHD. I'm thinking about something else, but I know they're way too slow at that point in the game, right? You got to know intervals. So PR interval, we know about that for first degree heart block. The QRS, we use that for bundle branch blocks. The QT interval is very important for people who pass out or have dysrhythmias. A long QT, QT can lead to torsades. So very important to know those things. All right, so looking at this 12 lead, would it be too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? I'd say the rate's okay-ish, right? They're between 50 and 140, so it's all right. So the next thing I'm going to do there is I'm going to look at injury patterns. And the way I do this is I do it the same way every time because there's some days I've been up 24 hours and I'm pretty tired. And I don't want to miss something that can hurt somebody. So I look at leads 1, AVL, and then 5 and 6. And I'm looking for ST elevation, okay? Is that showing up on the screen, Chief? Yes. No, okay. So 1, AVL, and 5 and 6. For ST elevation, if you got two leads with ST elevation, it's a STEMI, right? Or ST depression, which is concerning for ischemia. It makes you uncomfortable, but it's not a STEMI. The next place I look is leads two, three, and ABF. These are your inferior leads. So I'm looking for elevation or depression in one of these three leads here, okay? The next place I look is V1 through V4. And these are the harder to interpret places here. V1 and V2 are your septal. V3 and V4 are anterior leads. They all go down the main part of the heart, right down the midline. Elevation here is concerning for a big septal or anterior MI. Uh, these folks have MIs in that area. A big portion of their heart can be damaged. You can have some pretty bad outcomes long term, even if they survive, such as heart failure and issues like that. So important to pick up those things. The other thing you look for is ST depression. So T wave inversion, ST depression, and V2, 3, or 4 is a posterior MI. You don't have to do the fancy 12 lead with the EKG leads on the back. If you have this, that's diagnostic. No reason to go any further with that. And the last place I look is these AVR. So we learned in medic school that AVR was only good for one thing. If you're up in one, you should be down in AVR or vice versa. And you know your leads are on correctly. In actuality, if you're elevated in lead AVR, ST elevation, and you got depression anywhere else, such as in 2-3 AVF or laterally 1 ABL, 5 and 6, or even septal anterior, it makes you think you're having a big proximal left main lesion. Okay, those guys are having a STEMI equivalent. Probably should see a cardiologist. Big bad outcomes because of that. This is the diagram I swiped off the Google internet, right? That kind of shows you what's going on here and how it applies to looking at a 12 lead. So first case was a 64-year-old diabetic. She was awakened 30 minutes before EMS got there with some chest pain. The uh, first crews got there on scene, got blood pressure 180 over 60, respirations a little bit fast in the 20s. Heart rate 68, set 96%. Anytime you get an IV, get a glucose, gives you a lot of data. If it says low, I can fix it, 
right? If it says high, I know what the problem is, all right? They're in diabetic ketoacidosis or at least pretty sick with diabetes. If it says anything between low and high, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Everybody in Alabama has diabetes. We all eat crappy food, so not a big deal, right? Yes, yes, people smile. All right, so obviously this is a 12 lead class. We get a 12 lead on this chick. So this is our 12 lead. So too fast, too slow, or okay. I say the rate is okay, all right? So then I start looking at injury patterns. I look at leads one, I look at lead AVL, and I look at leads five and six. So I don't see anything super scary there. I got a two, three in AVF. She's got a Q wave here, some divots here, but there's no ST changes. So it's abnormal, but meh, doesn't really scare me. I go to V1 through V4. It looks fairly reasonable, no big elevation. The last place I look is lead AVR. After I finish that, I go back, I'm gonna look at my PR intervals, make sure it looks fine. My QRS is reasonable. My QT is fine. And because I don't want to miss a STEMI and I'm up late at night and I'm tired, I'm going to go back one more time before I put the EKG down and look to make sure I'm not missing something. One AVL, five and six, two, three and AVF, V1 through V4 and AVR. So don't really see a STEMI, EKG goes down. I'm going back to my patient, okay? So I want to do appropriate history, figure out what's going on and get a good exam. Now, the way we teach docs in the med school is we teach them to go into a patient's room, they talk to the patient, they get their history, they do their exam, and they come out and think about what they're going to do. We don't have that luxury in the EMS or the ER. We do it all at once. So I'm getting my history as I'm talking to my patient and getting my exam. So I'm on scene, reaching down, touching the pulse, is their skin warm or dry? Is their heart rate regular or irregular? If they got a radio pulse, the blood pressure is pretty stable. I'm looking at her, I'm getting a mental status exam as I'm looking at her because she's talking back to me, making good eye contact. And I'm trying to recognize, is she sick or not sick? Does she make me scary just on general appearance? When I start talking about histories, I think about STMs and STM stands for stuff that matters, right? Okay, stuff that matters. Okay, so the purpose of your history is determined is the patient sick or not sick and are they concerning for heart problems? So a 20 year old with chest pain and shortness of breath doesn't make me too uncomfortable, right? They're 20 years old, probably not heart problems. A 60 year old should probably make me a little bit uncomfortable. Now I'm gonna risk stratify with this history. Any history of heart problems, you ever had a heart attack or stroke? Yes or no? If they say yes, then my radar goes off, radar goes off thinking probably higher risk for heart disease. Let's do a little bit deep, deeper exam, make sure you get my 12 lead early, things like that, all right? Other things I ask about history of diabetes, do you take shots or pills? All right, everybody has diabetes. When I say shots or pills, let's say yes to shots, I think about insulin. That means they're probably type one, higher risk for bad outcomes. So that's the purpose of the history, okay? So that kind of gives them, puts them in a box, sick or not sick, high risk or low risk, all right? So this chick has a history of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, all right? So we know she's high risk, her EKG is okay. Uh, but she's still having chest pain. So we think about what we can do in the state. The state talks about appropriate things for chest pain management would be like using the old Mona mnemonics. Anybody remember that? What Mona stands for? Long time ago for morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. Some people like to use Fona for fentanyl if you don't carry morphine anymore. But the big thing for this person will probably be aspirin first off, right? So Aspirin uh, kind of inhibits platelets. If they are having a big heart attack, you give an aspirin, it jacks up the proteins on the aspirin so that if there's a clot there, these platelets don't stick together, blood flow goes down, clot doesn't get better. Aspirin is very important, okay? Only contraindication at this point in the game would be obviously anaphylaxis. If they say I shouldn't take aspirin because I have bleeding ulcers, reasonable, okay? They're not having a STEMI, hold the aspirin for now, not a big deal, all right? If they have a chest pain, we think it's ischemic in nature because of a clot or something, we give them nitro. It's going to make this vessel open up a little bit, dilate those vessels and improve bloodstream downflow. Nitro is reasonable. Uh, oxygen, American Heart talks about oxygen is good if they're hypoxic or breathing fast. She's breathing about 22 times a minute. I'll say that's a little bit labored. O2 is reasonable at that point in the game. Sats are fine. If you want to withhold it, not a big deal at this point in the game either. Okay. Morphine for chest pain. Morphine is an older narcotic. Morphine basically uh, has a histamine response. When you give morphine, it causes vasodilatation, just like nitro. So they go from having chest pain and hypertension and feeling bad to a little bit of morphine to like, yeah, I still hurt, but I don't really care. My blood pressure is better, right? It's like giving a good beer at the end of the day. So, all right, I'm gonna get in trouble. Not bad. Oh, bad. There's no such thing. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, so her vitals are fine. EKG is reasonable. She's still diaphoretic, good vitals, still having chest pain, post that aspirin and nitro. What else should we be doing for this patient now at this point in the game? What else is pretty important for her? So I would argue that we'd get this inappropriate joke, that serial, we to get serial EKGs. Uh -huh, funny, funny, not funny. Thanks for smiling. Uh, so repeat an EKG. So if a patient has a STEMI on their first EKG, there's no reason, reason to repeat it. Diagnosis is made. You get to the hospital with me and their EKG is completely normal and you show me an EKG that says STEMI, I'm calling cardiologists, they're going to the cath lab. You should not have an EKG that shows a big STEMI and gets better. You still have heart disease. You're going to see the cardiologist. If you don't have a STEMI, it's useful to repeat that, okay? Because you may get lucky and pick that STEMI up. And now you can put that patient in the STEMI system if you have that in your region. Or if not, you got that to show to the ER doc when you get there so we can get the cardiologist involved pretty quick and take care of this patient. And you won't have any wall time then, right? You go straight to a room, okay? Hey, doc. Yes. So you say it shouldn't get better if they have a STEMI, but right. it could look better based on treatment, right? So it after can. we give nitro, right. we can see a difference in the 12 lead maybe. Yes. So if somebody's having, if someone has heart disease, atherosclerotic uh, vessels, and they have a coronary vasospasm, you can have ST changes. You give them a nitro or something and dilates that vessel, that EKG can normalize or get better, right? Okay. But it's still, if they're having changes enough to make ST elevation, they need to go in for a diagnostic cath. So yes, you can see changes. And so, people that do cocaine sometimes will get coronary vasospasms, and you'll look at their EKG, their hypertensive, the tachycardic, EKG's got big ST elevations. And for cocaine, we give benzos to chillax them a little bit, right? We give them some Versed or Ativan, and you may actually see that EKG get better because you've decreased that sympathetic response and vasospasm. Gotcha. So if you did three 12 leads en route to the hospital, the first one showed STEMI, you gave nitro, second and third one did not. The first one, not the last one, is the one you want to show to the doc. Yes, you can show all three, but the first one. And my argument is I'm not going to waste my time. If it's me in the back of an ambulance by myself and I got somebody that just had a STEMI on the 12 lead, I'm not going to repeat that 12 lead. I'll be doing other things in preparation for bad things that could happen to them because of their STEMI, such as maybe a second IV, working on fluid boluses, calling to make sure the hospital knows we're coming. Hey, activate the cath lab team if you got one. If not, make sure the ER docs are there. This is a big STEMI, things can go bad, okay? So this 12 lead, too fast, too slow, or okay? I'd say it's okay-ish, all right? And uh, the rate is, what, 300, 150, 170, yeah. So 60 to 70, all right? I look at these one, ABL, and lateral, and now I got this T wave change here in AVL from last time. So that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I go here and look at leads two, three, and AVF, and now I got a big change, right? So now I got ST elevation leads three and AVF, all right? So this, this is a STEMI. We've done serial EKGs on this patient. The second one shows big ST elevation. So now she is a critical patient at this point in the game. So things change. I still finish through looking through my 12 lead to make sure I missed something. I look at V1 through V4. I look at AVR, I make sure my intervals haven't changed, and I lay this EKG down. But so now things change, right? So now we've gone from chest pain in a high risk patient to a patient that now we know has heart disease, having a big STEMI. So if we go back to thinking about our MONA, things that we talked about, if she, did not, if she did not get an aspirin earlier because she has a history of ulcers, or she said upsets her stomach, now it does not matter. Now aspirin could be a life-saving medication. The only reason she doesn't get an aspirin now is if she's allergic to aspirin and she says, last time I took an aspirin, you had to cut my neck to breathe for me. She doesn't get it then, that's anaphylaxis. Anybody else, we highly recommend they get aspirin at that point in the game, okay? Now, even if she's not hypoxic, she gets oxygen, okay? We don't call it supplemental oxygen, I call it pre-oxygenation before they go into cardiac arrest. People having STEMIs, they die in the first few hours from dysrhythmia, whether that be VTAC, VFib, or heart block. That's what gets them in the first couple of hours, okay? So if I go ahead and put oxygen on them now at a couple of liters, if they go into cardiac arrest and route to the hospital or while I'm on scene waiting for EMS, the transport team to show up, all I gotta do is crank her up to six to eight liters and she has passive oxygenation. I can start CPR, get on the pads and move that way. So very important stuff, okay? Other thing that she needs at this point in the game is DFib pads. Every chest pain patient does not need DFib pads. Your boss will fire you. Those things are expensive. But STEMI patients need DFib pads, okay? 
Because if you're in the back of a rescue by yourself, and that patient goes into V-fib, and you don't have pads on them, you're hosed. You got to pull over, start CPR, put them on the pads, charge it, and do all that stuff. Versus if the pads are on them, and you already have oxygen on them, they go into V-fib, you crank your O2 up to eight liters, as you're charging to defibrillate, you defibrillate, you may get them back pretty quick. A lot easier for that patient. So this is just a 12 lead, big ST elevation, inferior, lateral, everywhere. EMS did O2, got IV access, popped a nitro on the guy. In route, he started having a seizure. So they said he really wasn't having a seizure. He had a dysrhythmia and his brain got hypoxic and it makes you have those shakes like you would have in a seizure. They recognized it. They charged 200, defibrillated the guy, and they got him back. Had they not recognized the fact that he was having a big STEMI, they would not have put the pads on him. All right. If they weren't using the brain and critically thinking and they saw him having seizure activity, they're going to think, holy crap, dude's having a heart attack and a seizure. That's not going on. He's having a big freaking heart attack. And the seizure is the fact that he's now his brain is hypoxic and he's shaking because of that. So that was a good catch. I think that was Birmingham. I'm not sure. I don't see the. I may have taken it off. Nope. Semi inappropriate humor. I'm trying to be decent. Other things you're to think about with STEMIs is the state says we're required to do this form, which I'm sure everybody's seen. Right? Yes. Yes. I agree. Um, in reality, I would say that if this form is on your glove and you give this information to the physician, you're fine. Basically, what we're trying to do is figure out, can I give this guy a thrombolytic? With the STEMI, they're going to the cath lab, we open the vessel up, or we give them a drug to break open clots. All right. Some people we can't give that drug to. If they had recent brain surgery, they ever had a history of an aneurysm, if they have an active GI bleed, if they're crapping blood, we got to know that stuff. All right. Because we can't give them that thrombolytic. If you don't get this information, and as soon as they pull up to the hospital, they go into cardiac arrest, we start CPR and defibrillate them, we don't get them back in four to six minutes, I got to make the decision to lice them or not lice them. And if you don't ask these questions, we never know what's going on. So very important you get this information and you pass it on to the doc, okay? So standard of care in America is uh, cath abs. If you can't get them the cath app within 90 minutes, you got 30 minutes to give them a clot buster drug, the same drug we give for strokes, TPA. And basically what happens is we give that drug and it dissolves the strands that hold these clots together. So any clot in your body breaks open. OK, so if you have injuries, if you're bleeding somewhere, or aneurysm, those clots break open, they can bleed and they can die. But if they don't have those things. That clot in the heart breaks open and you get blood flow back to the heart and they can have a good outcome. So this is the cath ab uh, uh, images for that patient that had that inferior STEMI that's right sided. So if you look here, there's a big occlusion. They put the stent in and you can tell that whole vessel opened up. So that should be right there. Made a big difference. OK, so the aspirin the EMS gave made this clot not get bigger. When they get to the hospital, we give them heparin or other blood thinners. That helps this clot not get bigger. And then we either give them like the TPA or TNK, a clot buster, or they go to the cath ab. All right. So I know COVID has taken over everybody's mind, and, and I understand that as a global pandemic, but there are still things out there that are killing people besides COVID. The things that killed them before COVID are still there. So we got to be aggressive. We got to train, be able to recognize these things and make a difference. So, STEMI patients, we can salvage, we can save. Okay. The guy crossing a train track hit by a train, we probably can't save. All right. Some of these COVID patients, we got to take care of them, but still there's no definitive treatment. At least for heart disease and STEMIs, we got that. So we can't miss these things. We still got to train, take care of these people. Very important. This is going on every day, guys. This was a uh, 12 lead. This uh, patient came from a nursing home. They had uh, jaw pain, nausea, vomiting. And they also had a recent UTI, a little bit demented, hard to get a history. All right. So the medic that took care of this patient got a 12 lead. And you say, why would the medic get a 12 lead on a patient with a UTI and jaw pain? Because he recognized that acute coronary syndrome is what we're trying to catch. Our protocol should not be chest pain protocol. It should be ACS. And other signs and symptoms of heart attacks are out there. Diaphoresis, nausea, vomiting. OK, weakness, syncope. All right. 
And in old folks that are demented, you know they got heart disease. They're 78 years old. They might not know it, but they got it, right? Okay. Now I got a 78 year old female that's puking. She gets an EKG. All right. So excellent job of this medic. If you look at this 12 lead, rate too fast, too slow, are okay. I said the rate's okay. I start looking for injury patterns. That looks fine. Two, three, and AVF. This makes me uncomfortable. This T wave inversion. It's not a STEMI, okay, but makes me uncomfortable. I look V1 through V4, no elevation, but what I do have is deep depression, V3 and V4. This is a posterior MI. And if you look up here at the read of the EKG, does it say STEMI? It does not say STEMI. So machine is not always correct, but that astute medic was able to pick up, this is a posterior infarct, put it on some O2, put it on the DFib pads, changed destination hospitals, and en route, she became altered and confused, and she got 200 joules. And when I saw her, she was mad and cussing because she just got shocked, but she was alive. Yes. If you can remember that, he shocked her pretty quick, right? She still had brain perfusion. But great call by the medic. And again, it's all because he recognized that ACS is not just chest pain, and he recognized that EKGs, EKGs could be a screening tool for madness, that you can pick up something and you can save a life and make a difference. All right, next case was a 58 year old female with some weakness uh, found on the floor by her son after uh, they reportedly saw her pass out. All right, so show up on scene. We're gonna do quick scene survey. Does she look sick or not sick? Is she diaphoretic? Is she making eye contact? First responder is gonna kneel down, check a radio pulse start to expose her, somebody's putting the pads on her, somebody can get a set of vital signs. I would recognize that if you recognize that she was bradycardic on rapid pulse rate, somebody's already throwing passive oxygenation on her as well. So I would not get a 12 lead right off the bat on this patient. The heart rate is 34. That's probably too slow. You need to manage the patient before you get a 12 lead, right? So heart rate of 34, breathing about 12 times a minute, blood pressure, you got to palpate one about 80 palp. How do you manage this patient? What do you want to do? Scare her. Scare her. That's right. Show the tax bill. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I think three things: drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia. What's causing this? So that's going off my mind. At the same time, I'm thinking primary exam. So somebody's listening for lung sounds. We're getting a SAT probe. We're going to start an IV. Getting a quick ACU check. We start an IV. I'm hanging fluids on her. If husband said, but she has heart failure, I say, I don't care. She's bradycardic and hypotensive. She gets fluid right now. If I overload her right off the bat, we'll fix that in a minute. OK, you can't think too detailed. All right. So heart rate still 30. Blood pressure is 80. I got fluids going. AccuCheck reach 250. I don't care. It's not low. It's not high. All right. So what's the first drug I want to give her out of your box? Atropine. Atropine. Yes, it's old school. It's quick and it's easy. Atropine increases conduction to the AV node. There's no risk to atropine, okay? If she has a complete heart block, it's not gonna help her, but there's no risk to that. So you break the box open, I recommend give one milligram. AHA says you can give 0.5 to one, that's fine. For me, if I'm giving 0.5, I'm gonna have to squint, get out my glasses, figure out how much that is. If I give 0.5 and she doesn't get better, I'm gonna give another one. So I say, forget that, I'm gonna give one milligram. If it works, I high five my partner, I fire up a cigarette, we take her to the hospital, right? Okay. If it doesn't work, I'm moving on down the road. I got somebody that likes my jokes. This is good. I like this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so atropine doesn't work. What's the next drug I can try? It's quick, it's easy, it's cheap. So a couple of choices out there. So if you're lucky enough to still carry dopamine, dopamine's a great drug for bradycardia. It's gone by the wayside when you think about sepsis and for pressors in the hospital, but for hypotension and bradycardia, it's like cheating. It fixes both of those things. So it's a titratable drug. You spike the bag, you run the fluid through, you hook it up to the patient and you open it up. As it's running in, you're getting your second set of IVs. You're probably putting the pads on. Maybe you get another history, helping your partner get them on the monitor better. All right, you give it a couple of minutes. If the heart rate increases and blood pressure starts going up, you titrate it down with your thumb and you get a rate. I said at 10 mics per kilo per minute. OK, what you don't do is spend eight minutes calculating a dose. Is it sitting there not running into the patient? It's got to get in the patient to work. So dopamine's quick. It's easy. 
All right. Next drug I would think about would be calcium. So if you think about calcium, so things that make you get slow rhythms is hyperkalemia. Calcium fixes that. The other thing is epi, dopamine, all these drugs increase heart rate and blood pressure by increasing calcium in the cell. So calcium is a great drug to use. The problem in Alabama is calcium and pacing is category B. So I recommend you got this bradycardic patient there. You've done your assessment, IV fluids are cooking, you're giving your atropine, somebody's on the phone with med control, it could be your EMT, and they're saying, hey doc, you got a 58 year old female unresponsive to atropine and dopamine and bradycardic, I need orders for calcium and pacing. Thank you, okay? Don't give them a long history. ER docs are not patient, we don't like to hear long stories, we want to quicken the skinny, right? So 58 year old female, unresponsive to atropine, bradycardic, I need calcium, I need pacing. Ask for what you want. Any reasonable doctor should give that to you. If they don't, pass up the food chain to your EMS officer, to your state, to your uh, regional medical director. Okay. Obviously, pacing will work for these folks as well. Pretty quick and easy to do. So when I think about managing bradycardia, I think about a couple of things. I manage my ABCs as I'm thinking about the reasons. I'm giving atropine. If atropine isn't working, that one milligram, I'm spiking the dopamine, I'm hanging that. As I'm spiking that dopamine, it's going in. Somebody's online to med control for orders to cal for calcium and for pacing, okay? People talk about what about heart blocks? A first degree or second degree type two or third degree. Doesn't really matter right off the bat. We figure that out at the hospital. If they don't get better with atropine and dopamine, you gotta pace them. They're gonna get a transvenous pacemaker at the hospital anyway. Okay, we're gonna take care of that. So I will not worry about that right off the bat. Manage the patient. We figure out the type of heart block in a little while. Now there's some agencies that aren't carrying dopamine now and state has approved push dose epi. I'd recommend that if you're gonna use push dose epi that you practice before you do it. Push dose epi is not the one to 10,000 that we usually use in cardiac arrest. Push dose epi is one to 100,000, something we were not taught in medic school. It's basically taking one cc of one to 10,000, mixing it with nine cc's of saline and giving it at two to three cc's increments. So at two in the morning, when you're on your second 48 hour shift for the week, that's tough to do, okay? So practice if you're gonna do it. The other option to mix in this, if you take a milligram of epi and put in 100 cc's of saline and draw up some out of that, get some pushes. But again, state says you can do it, but that doesn't mean you should do it unless you know what you're doing and practice it, okay? There have already been a couple of mistakes in the Brims region where folks are giving 1 to 10,000 epi instead of 1 to 100,000. And the outcome to that will be somebody going from a heart rate of 38 to a heart rate of 188, which is cool. You get to defibrillate, right? All right. I'd recommend you just kind of let it ride, don't do anything, let it wear off. Uh, but it's not really funny. Uh, so if you're going to use push dose epi, make sure you practice and you train with that and make sure your offline medical director is happy with it. All right, so this is a, uh, let's see if it's gonna go. Yeah, to clarify, this is the guy's ear. So this is a chin, this is not a groin. I'm not showing you a groin, okay? All right, so you dispatch to a, uh, to a uh, stabbing. You get on scene, you got a guy sitting on the corner of the road, just sitting there, and he's got this big gaping wound to his neck, all right? He's sitting there, he's diaphoretic, he seems pretty agitated, but it's not bleeding. How do you manage that? What do you do with that? Not breathing. Not bleeding, sorry. Not bleeding. Yeah, I probably said breathing, but I meant bleeding. Post-aggressive. Yeah, that's what Chief Ward says. Anybody else, any other comments? Anybody even care? Good, nobody cares, I like this. It's American healthcare is finest. <laughs> Thanks for showing up today, guys, appreciate you. Great, yeah. So I would argue that I got a guy that's stabbed in the neck, cut in the neck, he's alive, he's breathing, he's not squirting blood, okay? I'm not gonna do anything to that. I'm gonna say, hey dude, come on, get up, let's get in the truck, start moving toward the hospital, do my exam as we go. And the reason I say that, you like that? That's his ear up there, that's pretty funny, at least in my mind. So the reason for that is because the neck has no unused real estate, right? So everything in the neck is important. There's all kind of vascular structures. So if he got cut that deep in the neck and he's not bleeding, a couple of things are going on. One, he's dead, there's no blood, but he's talking to him, so I can rule that one out. Two, he got lucky and nothing, no big vessel was hit. I can probably rule that out too. Nobody's that lucky, all right? Or three, a vessel got hit 
and he's young and healthy and his body is clotted that off. All right. And if I start screwing around, packing this wound, jacking with it, I'm going to break that clot. And he's going to start squirting and then you're not going to be able to fix it. And the guy's going to die. Obviously, that guy goes to a place that has vascular surgery or trauma surgery. If you're working in a region where you don't have that, he goes to the nearest hospital so we can secure an airway. He gets blood products and we fly him and get him to a vascular surgeon. OK, so I'd argue that if he's not bleeding, don't poke it. Don't do anything. He gets in the truck, start moving to the hospital, look for other wounds, IV access, get prepared for the madness that could happen. Now, if he's bleeding, everything changes, right? No. <laughs> Only in. No, no tourniquet. No, no tourniquet. But what could you do for this guy? So you get up on scene and he's sitting up there. He's got blood oozing out of his neck. You sit there, he kind of lays back and he's got pretty good pulse top flow coming out of his neck. Pulse setting. What are you going to do for that? Not a tourniquet. TXA? Yeah, that takes a few minutes. What can you do first? So just hands on, just direct pressure. Yeah, yeah. The ABC's basic stuff goes way far, man. So I'm going to have gloves on already. I'm going to put my fingers in that hole and I'm going to try to plug it. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if somebody give me some combat gauze, if you have that. If not, give me some four by fours or ABD pads and I'm going to pack that wound like crazy. Hold direct pressure. Okay. Chief Ward mentioned TXA. TXA is a great drug. They approved it for uh, uh, last protocol update or the year before. I can't remember now. But TXA is a drug. It's not a blood product, but basically when you think about a clot in the body, the body has a wound. It sends cells to that wound and make it stop bleeding and make a clot. A few minutes later, the body sends more cells around there and says, okay, do we really still need this clot or can I use these proteins somewhere else? So it breaks that clot down and goes away. If that thing starts bleeding again, it makes more clot. The problem is you're eventually running out of those proteins that make clots and people bleed to death. TXA makes it where once you make a clot, that clot hangs out and stays there. Now that's the redneck physiology of that, okay? But that's the way it basically works. So if you got TXA, it's great. He gets IV access, he gets two grams of TXA real quick, and that will make, if there's a clot in there, make it work. The other options you can do, sometimes I've taken TXA and put it on a four by four, and then pack a wound with it. And TXA works topically as well. Now that's category B, so you can't do that without calling med control. So I think I would do that as I'm moving toward the hospital. I want to be sitting on scene with somebody pouring blood out their neck, right? So the point of this is, if it's not bleeding, don't poke it. Don't mess with it, right? Maybe you'll get lucky. If it is bleeding, it's probably all hands on decks. Pack the wound, combat gauze, IV access, moving toward TXA. If you're a critical care unit, they're getting blood and plasma as well right off the bat, okay? High risk for decompensation, high risk for death. If it becomes altered and obtunded, intubate him, get an airway. If he's bleeding externally, he can bleeding, be bleeding internally. They can cause a big airway obstruction, okay? But again, all these things are moving toward definitive care, all right? Definitive care for this guy is vascular control, hemorrhage control by a surgeon, and blood products. Definitive care for a STEMI is a cardiologist with a balloon or an ER doc with TPA or TXA, all right? So things we can't fix in the field, we move to the hospital as quick as we can as we're doing what we can. Things we can fix in the field, we stay and fix, all right? Cardiac arrest, we stay on scene, we work loads, okay? All right, CPR doesn't work in the back of an ambulance. We manage loads in the field to save a life. This guy, we can't fix it in the field. So we're packing the wound, moving toward the hospital. The, uh, we got a few more minutes. So what I'm gonna do next time is we're gonna talk more detail about uh, a little bit deeper into cardiology again and go over some left bundles and right bundles. Uh, we've had some questions about those. So this EKG, too fast, too slow or okay. I'll say that the rate is okay. I look injury patterns. I say that looks abnormal, but not a STEMI. Abnormal, but not a STEMI. Five and six, I got this T wave change here. Makes me uncomfortable for ischemia, but not a STEMI. Two, three and AVF, same thing. V1 through V4, I got some elevation here and elevation here. So is it a STEMI or not a STEMI? That's the question with this patient. I finish out my look. I look at the AVR. It looks funky, but no ST elevation. I'm going to go back and look at intervals. I really don't see any P waves, so I'm thinking AFib. I look for my QRS. My QRS is greater than 120. 
So now I go to say QRS is wide. I either got a left bundle or a right bundle. I go to V1. V1 is pointing down. That is a left bundle. So that's a lot for one class, but you know we've talked about these in, intermittently in the past as well. The importance with left bundles is once the machine sees a left bundle, it's not going to interpret whether it's having a STEMI or not. And there's some rules we can use to look to see if somebody's having a STEMI with a left bundle. It's called scarbosis criteria. Now that's next level paramedicine. My goal for these classes is that folks to be very comfortable recognizing STEMI or not STEMI because hopefully the state will go statewide soon with the STEMI system. My ideal situation would be at some point in the next amount of time, we actually have access to pre-hospital lytics as well. Um, you know, some regions have numerous cath labs, numerous ERs. We can manage that. Other regions do not have access to that. So being well-trained, well-trained medics that can interpret 12 leads, can risk stratify, can kind of go through a checklist. Can they get thrombolytics or not get thrombolytics? Something reasonable to do. It's been done in other countries, actually been done in other states. So maybe one day we'll get there. So this 12 lead, too fast, too slow, or okay. I say the rate is okay. I start looking injury patterns. One, AVL, looks good. B5 and six makes me very uncomfortable. That looks like a big STEMI to me. Two, three, and AVF makes me uncomfortable as well. V1 through V4, not super scary. AVR is down, lead one is up. That looks reasonable. I go back, look at for my <clears throat> intervals. I got a PR interval, I got P waves. My QRS is wide. So then I think, is it a left bundle or a right bundle? I say this is a left bundle. Machine agrees, machine doesn't say it's a STEMI, but lo and behold, that's a freaking STEMI that most folks pick up anyway. So a lot of things we got to get better at. Uh, EMS has always been the guru of three lead interpretations. I remember 30 years ago, medics knew, you know, first degree, secondary heart blocks, junctional rhythm, could read three leads like it's nothing. We got to move on and do 12 leads the same way. We should be the masters of 12 leads because we have a way to fix those things that we see wrong now. We can shock, we can pace, we can cardiovert, and in the hospital, we can do a cath app or life somebody. Here's another 12 leads just to show you. Look at V2, 3, and 4. If you miss that as a STEMI, you need to buy some glasses or go work somewhere else. But the machine does not miss it. The machine does not pick it up. The machine says it's a pacemaker. I don't even see pacemaker spikes. And that was not entering the system. Somebody having that big of a STEMI is going to have a bad outcome. They're probably going to decompensate pretty quick. Questions, comments, statements within reason. Should I say not within reason? Will I get a question then maybe? I don't know. Yeah, I've got a question. Can we put, um, if it's not bleeding, don't poke it on a t-shirt? Yes, sir, you can. I'm not going to buy that t-shirt, but yes, sir, you can. Yes. I, I made some notes about that one. Okay. Good. Help me. Help me. All right. So, so guys, guys here in Aniston, if you have a STEMI patient, uh, where do you transport? Where, what are the STEMI capable hospitals in this uh, area? We would transport to Aniston RMC. Because they, they have the cath lab there, so that'd be where we'd go first. So just one choice? Springfield has a cath lab. Do they have a cath lab? Uh, I'm thinking all cardiac go to RMC now. RMC now, RMC now. okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have long, so. So there's not a whole lot of decision making to happen there. Right, yeah. But the decision making there is, is it a STEMI or not a STEMI? So I can tell you, any ER that I work at, if I know a STEMI's coming in, <clears throat> And I know I've got eight minutes. That gives me eight minutes to finish up what I'm doing. So if I'm showing somebody, I'm like, well, crap, I got to finish up, get out this patient, and get out there in a few minutes. Um, if I don't have that, then somebody's tapping on my shoulder 15 minutes later, bringing me an EKG. Then I'm like, holy crud bucket, that's a STEMI. Okay. So STEMI patients or critical patients, I would recommend when you get to the hospital, if you call it ahead, show that EKG, find that doc, give it to them. Okay. We as ER positions are held to a standard. So we have 30 minutes from arrival to give them a thrombolytic drug, or we have up to nine minutes to find them a cath lab. All right. So if we don't hear about this patient until 20 minutes after they're there, 
I got 10 minutes to do something. And those are things that we get feedback on. And just like uh, you guys, when you get feedback from your boss, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, but it's never enjoyable, right? Mm -hmm. So same thing with us. So show that EKG to the doc, okay? Nothing wrong with the nursing staff, they should see it too. But I'm telling you, if you got a stimulant or 12 lead from you feel and you give it to that ER doc, they're gonna get up from what they're doing and come to you and this is running the code already. Okay, very important. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks Dr. Burson, great lecture as always. And we're gonna take a few minute break and then we're gonna come back with Dr. Evans. Everybody stay tuned, we'll be right back. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna continue now with Dr. Evans from UAB. He's got a great lecture for us today on wilderness and environmental emergencies. Hey guys, you hear me okay? Good. All right. So for those of y'all who hadn't met before, I'm Joel Evans. I'm one of the ER docs that work with Ferguson out at UAB. Um, from Pell City, so I work in Pell City a little bit as well. So those of y'all from this area, if y'all do happen to go that far, you'll see me every now and then over there. So what we're gonna talk about today are just obviously what the title is, Wilderness Avert Environmental Emergencies. This is going to be kind of just a breeze through. I'm going to cover just a couple topics really for the time period of the year. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute, but this is a really, really broad specialty. And so it's actually a dedicated subset of subset of emergency medicine um, can be in other specialties as well. But this is because it's its own subspecialty. We can't hit everything. I mean, we can we can have some conversations, but my goal today is just to kind of let you know that this is going to cover some medical diagnoses and a wide variety of some injury patterns and a lot of honestly wilderness medicine is a lot like being in the field think about you have to macgyver a lot of stuff um you don't have all the technology so you come to the hospital and they say why didn't you do this why well, didn't have it or i just carried the guy 10 miles out of the woods i'm not i, I did the best i could well that's kind of what wilderness medicine is all about they realize that we're still going the pre-hospital way we're still doing austere environments, but maybe if a physician or, or a specially trained medic like mountain rescue or whatever, um, having a subspecialty of the medicine is pretty good. So nonetheless, outline for today, we're in the fall, we're in the winter, lots of hunting, and that's kind of where this goes from. I'm from Pell City again, so that's what a lot of my friends do. We all, it's, it's nice to be out in the woods, but it's cold. So we're going to talk about hypothermia, frostbite, a little bit about submerged and drowning. A lot of more of that happens in the summertime, obviously, because more people are on the water. But it does happen in the wintertime and some special considerations for drowning during the wintertime. We'll go over altitude sickness. No, we don't have a lot of altitude here. But some people listening to this may go to Colorado or wherever, go skiing, and then you'll have some ideas about what happens there. And then very briefly, if we have time, we'll go over some animal bites. There's not a lot to that one, but again, we're going after all of this thinking, I'm going in the woods or I'm going skiing, the stuff that you would do in the winter time, okay? So case number one, Rescue 51, you're going in route to Highway 411 to the Rampart Hunting Camp. You got an old man who's exhibiting ultra mental status times four hours. All right, routine call, old guy, can be a laundry list of things. But when you get there, you actually find he's a 72 year old man, severely altered, incoherent speech, but he's also complaining of bilateral hand and foot pain. The issue is the bystanders give you more information and say, hey, he was actually found at the bottom of his tree stand. He didn't come back at dark. So we went and looked for him. We found him laying at the bottom of his tree stand like this. So you get to him, his pulse is 51. His blood pressure is marginal, but it's still OK. Respiratory rate is 23. And it's O2 is 97%. So initially you've got again laundry list of things that could be. What are some of your thoughts? Old guy, bottom of a tree stand, could have fallen, could have had a stroke, could be having a heart attack. Could be a ton of things. This time of year, it's cold right now. So that's one thing that should be at least in the back of your mind. You're looking for everything, but at least in the back of your mind, be thinking of cold injury. So this is where we start talking about accidental hypothermia. And just fair warning, we're gonna get off in the weeds just a little bit on this. Um, it's gonna be more than 
in paramedicine, we're more than just grab them, warm them, get them to a hospital. There are a lot of other special considerations that we do when we talk about these things. So the definition of hypothermia is it's a medical emergency that occurs when our body loses heat faster than it can be regenerated. And it's usually, it's, the definition is it's gonna be at 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, okay? So we always think about it being in the wintertime, super cold, there's snow on the ground, not a lot in Alabama, but there's some snow. Aniston, y'all get a lot more than we do. Um, but any cold, wet condition, so even if it's fall, if you're outside or it can be the wintertime, I'm sorry, summertime, but it's just to having to be a cool night. And if you're completely exposed or wet, you can still have hypothermic conditions, okay? So again, it's more common when it's really, really cold outside, but anything that can that is ambient air temperatures lower than body temperature and you're going to lose your heat, you can technically develop hypothermia. So around 1,300 deaths per year due to excessive natural cold in America. I hate to keep throwing definitions at you. This is not something I want to keep doing, but I think it's really important in this lecture that these definitions are part of it. So types of heat loss, it's not just one way or another there are actually multiple ways that you lose heat so you have conduction if you look at this it was the best figure i could find i liked it again it's dr google that helped me out here conduction is where you lose heat into the whatever you're sitting on this guy's sitting on a rock it's a cold rock heat's um, transferring from his body to the rock it could be the ground it could be whatever it may be but conduction direct transfer of heat to the surface you're contacting Convection is heat's lost through airflow. So if you've got a, long, a real brisk wind, 20 miles an hour, then that's pulling heat away from the body as it crosses the body. Kind of think if you have a hot cup of coffee, you're blowing on it. That's technically convection. Um, radiation, so it's just your heat emanating from your body getting lost into air. Evaporation, of course, we know what that is. That's you sweat, sweat dries, gets taken out in the air. And then respiration is just you lose heat through warm humidified air that you're actually breathing out. So you're breathing in a bunch of cold air, but you're breathing out your, your body core temperature. All right. So stages of hypothermia, again, you don't have to know every single detail, but it helps know predictive patterns. Everything we do is all in predictive patterns. So if I know about what stage this person's gonna be in, I know what to expect down the road. So initial stages of a neurologically intact victim. Let's say this was a 20 year old guy. He's only been missing 30 minutes. When you get to him, this is somebody who's well above 32 degrees Celsius. So their core temperature is above 90 degrees. You're going to see a ton of shivering. They're just going to sit there and just be freezing, 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 freezing. Well, that shivering's helping generate heat. That's why you do it. But Initially, you have an increased metabolism. It's your body surgeon to try to protect itself, the fight or flight. They're going to breathe more quickly. And then initially, you're going to have increased cardiac output with all that. So that sympathetic surge, everything's trying to fight or flight. And then we're going to fall off the kind of fall off the map. Once you start to get to that 33, 34 degrees and lower, now their brain activity starts to decline. Um, they're going to get irritable. They're going to get more confused, which confounds the problem poor decision making, lethargy, somnolence. And I'm gonna stop at the poor decision making. There are actually some kind of counterintuitive things. These people, when you get severely cold, their brain doesn't register anything anymore. And now they're sitting there basically trying to say, oh, I'm actually hot. These clothes are constricting. And now they start pulling off clothes, which is gonna compound the problem. So um, be aware if this person's severely cold, just know that their mentation is not right. Probably not somebody you necessarily want to go after ketamine or go after um, restraining or sedating. However, if they're a danger to themselves, do what you need to do to take care of that patient and your crew. All right. And then the good thing about this, so there's, there's a downside and there's a plus side. So what we're going off of is the downside is they're going to get really confused. They can go into a coma and things can get worse from a medical standpoint. On the plus side, as they get colder, we're actually getting the benefit of what we would do in therapeutic hypothermia post-arrest. 
So they have less cerebral oxygen requirement, so this neuroprotective, and actually the tissues themselves to a degree, especially the myocardial tissues, um, that colder temperature, they don't have as high metabolism now, and so they're not using as much oxygen. So they can survive arrest periods or hypoxic periods a little bit better. All right. Now below 30 degrees, which is below 86 degrees Fahrenheit, the shivering is going to stop. The metabolism is really, really slow. And now you start going down as far as your cardiac output. So remember, initially everything goes up, respiration, cardiac output, everything. But once we get really cold, it starts to go down and exactly what you would expect. Everything slows down. And one thing to note, once you're below 30 degrees, you're going to see bradycardia, but you're at very high risk of dysrhythmias, most notably BFib. Okay. So just kind of going back over that, there's two classifications. We're going to mainly go over the one on the right because that's all we care about in EMS. I don't care that you know. One, you're not going to know what the temperature is. You're going to know it's 20 degrees outside, so they're probably pretty stinking cold. But just so you can kind of get on some of the the uh, symptoms you'll see mild they're still shivering they're going to be tachycardic because it's early they're kypnic you're going to see maybe even some purple or red fingertips toes that just tells you the blood's trying to shunt to the core and so vasoconstriction peripherally all right one big thing that's kind of weird hyperglycemia so altered mental status you should always get a blood sugar right and I know we're jumping a little bit, but we'll get back into the, the case. Always get a blood sugar, but you're going to see a super high blood sugar. Don't let that throw you off and say, well, this person's in DKA. They might be, but if it's 20 degrees outside, they're outside, they're at the base of a hunting stand, it's probably not a sugar problem. Naturally, what your body's going to do is sympathetic surge. You're going to release a little bit extra sugar, but more importantly, when you're super cold, the insulin doesn't work anymore. So that's why you're going to see these sugars that are a lot higher than you would expect. Not a thousand, but two, three, four hundred. It's not unexpected in these cases. When you get to moderate, now everything starts to slow down. The more you get cold, the slower things go. So the patient's more confused. Um, they can't coordinate real well. Skin's real pale because of all the blood shunting. Severe, at this point, you're going to start to see the bad things. Severe bradycardia, hypotension, amnesia, or at that point, possibly even they're getting stuporous into a coma. And then when you get really, really cold below 20, 20 degrees, you're going to be probably asystolic. You're not going to be breathing. Not conducive with active life. Now, remember this neuroprotective. So that protects them and you can you can revive that person a lot more easily and they'll come out neurologically intact most of the time. Well, sometimes. So that's really, really busy slide. What I like is this one. It's the Swiss stage, and it's built for the Swiss mountain medics. OK, I don't care if you know every detail and you're not going to know the temperature, but you can go up to them. Are they awake? Are they still shivering? All right, they're class one. So they're mild. Are they a little confused, but now they're not no longer shivering? All right, that's getting more concerning. So they're class two. Their temperature's getting down to where we got to worry about dysrhythmias. Okay. Now, if they're unconscious, not shivering, but you have vital signs, they're really cold, and these are the ones to be very careful with. And then no vital signs, you're less than 24 degrees. So, all right. So, again, don't worry about this. Swiss staging is a real important one because, again, predictive patterns of what's coming next. So let's go back to our patient. We're going to evaluate and manage this patient. So first step, obviously it's cold as crap outside. We're going to move them to a warm environment to do everything else. It's not the time that you want to say, like a trauma patient on the side of the road in the middle of the summer, cut clothes off, expose, and let's look for injuries. This is a patient very gently move, and then we'll do another assessment. So second step, you're evaluating for life threats. Third step, you're going to start to rewarm. We're going to go into those a little more detail. So step one is one of the more, most important things we can do. So safely move the patient to a warm environment. So number one, your safety is paramount. If you've ever heard one of my lectures, number one thing I want all of y'all to go home. We're going to try to save the patient, but you and your crew have to got, have got to go home. So if you can't safely get that patient out, you can't safely rescue the patient. I hate it. 
but you're the most important person on the scene, okay? So if you can, once you get to the patient, safely move them to a warm environment. And this is where it's the biggest critical thing for this patient. When we move them, this is not, hey bud, we got a two mile walk. You need to, come on, let's go. All right. If they're not just barely mild, if they are completely conscious, barely shivering, and you've only been out here for 20 minutes, okay, maybe they can walk out if possible. However, the vast majority of these guys, we actually do not want them to exert themselves. We don't want them walking out. We want to carry them out. And the reason is for something called after drop. After drop is a phenomenon that basically, if you've got all this shunning, and you can see normal person, hypothermic person, very cold extremities, blood is stagnant in those extremities because of the vasoconstriction. So you got really cold blood sitting in the hands, really cold blood sitting in the legs. If I now tell that patient to move, where's all that cold blood going to all of a sudden go? Their heart rate's going to go up. The muscles are going to constrict. Now I'm sending a bunch of cold blood to the core that's trying to keep itself warm. So you can actually drop their core temperature. They're already in a problem. You can drop that core temperature anywhere from four to six degrees more with this after drop. So this is why ideally where we're going to transport them is we're going to transport them horizontal just to keep everything on a level playing field. We don't want their limbs to move, so we don't want them grabbing at things. We want them st steady and stable. And then, you know, when if we have to go the route of starting to rewarm them, we don't want to give them just boluses and boluses and boluses of fluids because what it's going to do is push cold stuff back toward the core. OK, so the after drop is really, really important. So this altered guy, if we try to help him walk out, we don't watch for the after drop really carefully, make sure his clothes are warm and all. Then by the time we get him to the ambulance, before we can even do anything, now his core temperature is 24 and now he's arrested. So we're behind the eight ball a little bit, okay? The other part of this is we've talked about after drop, we talked about how to get him in and out, but also keep your ambulance warm. You know, we usually do this in the, this time of year. We try to keep the ambulance as warm as possible. But they're actually saying minimum 24 degrees. Realistically, it's 28, which is about 82, 85 in the back of the truck. Which if you've got all your cold weather gear, you don't have time to take all that off working with the patient. It's going to get hot. It's going to get real hot real quick. You know, I remember a lot of years where we would jump in the truck and the first thing I'd do is I'd strip. But... And the critical patients, you're going to be a lot of cold weather gear, gloves, maybe your hat. It's going to get real hot real quick. OK, but best for the patient. Once you move into the warm environment, we're going to evaluate for life threat. So this is the point. Don't don't expose them in the cold because we're going to add to the after drop, not just moving them around, but we're going to expose their skin. Now they're going to get more radiating heat. So warm environment. Now we're going to look for life threats. This guy fell potentially. So we need to see, does he have an open femur fracture? Does he have something? We need to intervene on right there, then and there, okay? So do a quick assessment. If they have wet clothes, this is where they come off. And now wrap the patient in warm, warm gear, all right? But when you do this, even in the back of a warm ambulance, take really special care not to leave the patient exposed. Once you, find, once you see the chest, something goes back on the chest. If you're cutting off wet clothes, they get out of the way and immediately new warm things go on the patient because even in the back of the ambulance it's a warm environment well human body temperature is 98.6 degrees even if you've got it hot at 80 degrees in the ambulance that's still ambient air that they're going to continue to lose heat okay so that's why you see if you come to uab's trauma bay we cut their clothes off but we are supposed to now sometimes they leave them exposed for longer than we need to um but they're supposed to, as soon as humanly possible, put warm blankets on that patient for the same reason. Because even though you've got accidental hypothermia, you can cause iatrogenic hypothermia in the OR, in the ER, by us not covering the patients well. All right. So um, this is where you would get to your vital signs. Place patient on the monitor. So the two key things. you got to play, place a patient on the monitor. And if you think they're cold enough, so if they get into this, sorry. If they're in the class two or three, they're really stinking cold, very high risk of dysrhythmias. So I'd put pads on these patients. Okay. You've got reasons to do it. They could go into V-fib very, very quickly. 
Okay. And one thing I didn't mention when we're talking about V-fib in these patients, when you're moving them, moving very gently. So this is not the guy you grab, throw on a stretcher, and you jostle as you go out. Their heart is very irritable at 28 degrees, 30 degrees Celsius. So if you jostle them around, you could throw them into V-fib. Okay. So all these patients, if you're concerned about them at all, if they're level two, three, or worse, get v get pads on. They get monitor. Um, now, a lot of people, I throw out a lot of temperatures to you. Is there any way we can, do you think we can get temperatures on these patients in the field? So, no. It's funny you mentioned that because we just gave out a bunch of IPACs that have temperature modules mm -hmm. uh, that include the esophageal slash rectal probes. Yep. Esophageal, good. Rectal, honestly, not very good. The rectum is still a little bit further away from the core. You're going to have a delay there. So you may have an 80 degree or 90 degree rectal temp. Their core temp's probably down to 85. It just takes time. In the hospital, we throw Foley catheter, like temp sensing Foley catheters all the time. That's like a rectal probe. It's okay. It's better than what we had, but it's not nearly as good as a soft geal. So if you know, if y'all know how to throw the esophageal down, it's the best temperature measurement you can get. But the trucks that have just a rectal thermometer, no, it's not gonna work. So. Cool, I didn't know that, that's awesome. Well, it's okay, because none of us know how to use it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ferguson may, but uh, that's not something I even do. That's just because he's old, that's all. All right, so kind of going along with step two, we're doing our vital signs you're gonna see some dysrhythmias. So some things to look out for on your EKG. Bradyca bradycardia is honestly gonna be the most common rhythm because we're us we're not getting them 15 minutes into hypothermia where we're gonna see the tachycardia. We're usually getting them, they've been out for a couple hours or longer. So you're gonna see profound bradycardia sometimes. Not the 50, you could really see 20s and that's kind of okay. Again, this is neuroprotective, the cold state. But profound bradycardia is not uncommon. Osborne waves are kind of a neat little thing. At the end of the QRS complex, it's a little extra notch. If you see that, that means that patient is pretty stinking cold. They're probably in the 32 or maybe 34 range. And then of course you could have something worse later, but. So Osborne waves are kind of neat. Occasionally you'll see it, especially in Birmingham. And I know you probably will hear, um, we have a very high homeless population. Well, we have warming stations, but there are some guys that either aren't allowed to go there or they don't go. So we'll occasionally get some guys that are found altered on the side of the street and they'll come in and we see these Osborne waves and we're like, oh, they're probably cold. And this is before we do anything to figure out their actual core temp. Um, now, the biggest thing is you're going to get a prolonged QT interval. As everything slows down, just like with hyperkalemia, this will start to slow down and widen out. And now you start to get a lot more um, concern for things like V-fib. So as you start to see it, if you're monitoring progression in the truck, Osborne wave, they're pretty sick. They have a high chance of getting worse. As they get worse, everything widens out. And then you start to get your prolonged QT interval, widen the QRS, and all of a sudden they'll hit V-fib. So just keep a real close eye on that, that progression. If you start to see all that, we need to get more aggressive with our warming or make sure that we're not missing something. So maybe he's exposed in an area we didn't see. Maybe he's got wet clothes on that we didn't cut off. So. Hey doc, so in the field, we might mistake that for maybe acidosis mm -hmm. and, or hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, sodium bicarb, calcium not indicated if it's caused by hypothermia, is that correct? Correct. And it's all about just setting. You know, if this is a patient that you got out of a warm house and you're seeing this, and they got a fistula or something. Yeah, hyperkalemia is very possible. And hyperkalemia is not impossible in this. It actually is very possible. We'll go over it a little bit later, but in the hospital, hyperkalemia from all this ischemic tissue is very common. And when you get to a certain level, it's actually reasons to terminate resuscitation. Okay, so that would kind of be the same mechanism to get to hyperkalemia that we see, that we talked about with burn patients. Exactly. Last so, time. Yep. yep. 
So while I've got you stopped, we got a couple of serious questions, a little bit off topic. But That's fine. We'll digress a little bit. So the first question we had from the internet is, did you drive your Trans Am today? <laughs> so I did very, not. Okay. All right. So on a so serious, it's a truck, man. That's okay. I responded to him that you brought your private jet. So on, <laughs> the, <laughs> on a serious note, uh, it's just for Dr. Ferguson. Uh, it says, wanted to ask regarding neck wound patient. Have you seen physicians use external use of Epi 1 to 1,000 to close the wounds? Um, could that be an option for us now or in the future? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the mic got me. I got confused. Yeah, we use uh, uh, lidocaine with Epi sometimes to help uh, make the wound not bleed so much for superficial uh, vessels. Um, I don't see a big benefit pre-hospital for it, really. Um, I think the neck wound, I'd be more concerned about big bleeding. So I think direct pressure, combat gauze, TXA, um, scalp wounds, I think sometimes you can kind of stop those from bleeding pretty good with Lido with Epi, but otherwise I don't see a big need. What about you? No, I agree. Honestly, a lot of things that we would do, and I use just the pre-hospital things, like if I'm at Talladega, I don't really have much, like if I'm working at Talladega Race, I don't have a lot of ER style stuff. I do, but I don't. We'll squirt TXA on a wound or squirt it on galls if you don't have the combat galls. So I'm with I'm with Ferguson. I would be really worried about poking needles in that area at that point and throwing lidocaine with epi there. I would be more on squirt a bunch of TXA either in the patient, so a gram through the IV, or squirt a ton on a, a gauze, pack the wound with it if I don't have combat galls. Yeah, this question actually asked about epi one to one thousand. So that, that would probably not be the greatest idea to externally apply Epi 1 to 1000. Yeah. In a vertebral vessel with that and gain systemic circulation, that would probably be bad too. So I would say no. Got you. Thanks. Sorry for the interruption. No, that was good. That's a good question. I see where you're going that mechanistically. All right. So we've talked about kind of every all the assessment. And now the big thing is how do we we rewarm? So we only have certain things that are available to us in the pre-hospital setting, right? I'm gonna get them out of the environment. I'm gonna cut any wet clothes off, like saturated clothes, and then I'm gonna get blankets on them. Okay, those are the biggest things I can do. Um, tell me if y'all do this. When I was a medic, we were I'd throw so we didn't keep our fluids in the station unless it was super cold. What would you do? You throw them in the dash and you th you turn the, the dash heater on high. When we get there, maybe it's sort of warm. I don't know. But that's one thing you can do. One big thing you want to do is if you give this patient fluid, again, we're not giving huge, large boluses because I'm not trying to take that shunted blood back to the heart real quick. They a lot of times do need fluids because they're hypotensive. But make sure your fluids are not cold. That's the biggest thing. So it got to where the end of my career, I did start taking our fluid bag in just because I started, you know, we had some issues with some really, really cold fluids. You'd grab it, it'd almost freeze your hand. But just make sure your fluids aren't cold. If you can warm them, that's great, but it's not gonna be a way that you actually actively warm the patient. So if you see this, so this tells you, this chart right here is how many degrees Celsius per hour, which is a couple degrees Fahrenheit, can you gain from whatever? So passive, you just have a ton of blankets in the truck and you're packing them around the patient. That gets you about a half degree Celsius an hour. You got a bear hugger, the one that actually forces warm air over the patient, you get a degree or two an hour. If you have warm blankets like the kind we have in the trauma bay, you get two to four. I mean, those things are pretty stinking warm. And then if you notice right here, warm IV fluids, there's an, it's, it's a dash. You're not gonna really give them a lot of heat through your IV fluids. You'd have to heat it pretty stinking hot and you could actually cause more problems. You can hurt them with it though. So fluids actually are just neutral. If you have warm IV fluids, they're gonna prevent them from getting lower unless you give them cold IV fluids. So that's my, that's my diatribe on IV fluids. They're great. You're gonna have to have them probably, but make sure they're not cold is the big thing. All right. And then once you get to the hospital, then we can do other crazier stuff. There's plural bladder lavage where we take tons of warm fluid and we can either put in the worst way, 
we can put two chest tubes on either side, get some dual exhaust going, and we'll flush fluid through them, warm fluid. I've never seen it done. Have you? It does. It does. Um, I've again never seen that one done. <laughs> yeah, and that still sounds pretty bad. The bladder lavage is basically exactly what you think about. It's you put a foley in and you just have constant flush. It's what we do. We have uh, irrigating foleys when you have a lot of hematuria, a lot of blood. You use the same thing, but you're t putting tons of warm fluid through. You can actually gain decent amount of warmth through that. But if they're severely cold and survivable, hopefully, you put them on ECMO. That's the best way. They get them 7 to 10 degrees per hour. So if they come in profoundly hypothermic, you think it's somebody we're going to save at UAB, we're going to probably throw them on ECMO and see what we can get. Okay. It's a little bit tough when you go to the small hospitals because then you have to worry risks versus benefit of getting them to an ECMO center. But nevertheless, here, that's, that's what you got. All right. So any questions on that? So our guy, all we could do in the pre-hospital setting, get them out of the environment, put them in a warm truck, get the wet clothes off, and tons of blankets. Okay. So one question, Doc. Um, We've seen literature in the past that says if the severely hypothermic patients in cardiac arrest that only chest compressions and BLS airway maneuvers should be done. Is that something you've heard in the past or any reasoning behind that? Yeah, we're actually going to get to that in the next topic. No, 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 you're good. You're perfect segue. So I did want to show you this. This is a cold card that they give out in Canada to a lot of their, their Mounties and medics up there. Very quick, tells you what, what stage you're in and what to do. So moderate hypothermia, handle gently. Keep horizontal, don't let them walk, don't let them eat or drink. Because we don't want food going in the belly, blood trying to shunt to the belly to digest this food. I don't care about your belly at this point. I want blood at your heart, blood at your brain. So I like this card a lot. And if we want to, I can find a way to get it uploaded somewhere or give you all the link. But this is something that's kind of neat on the back of this card. It tells you in the wilderness medicine world how to package this patient. So we're in the middle of the woods. We've got a hypothermic patient. They lay a tarp down and then a pad to prevent that radio, uh, that conductive heat loss. Then you have a sleeping bag. And then we've got the Mylar blanket. And then we've got a bunch of heat packs. OK, so this would be a great way to package our patient. You take a bunch of the, the electrical or chemical heat packs from the truck groins just like you would do with with ice packs for hyperthermia which we're not going to go over today groin chest sorry groin chest pit anywhere that you would lose a lot of heat all right so you got the chem packs there now you wrap them in plastic foil or the mylar blanket then you put the sleeping bag around them and you basically just it's layer on layer of a burrito roll if you think about it that gets a lot of heat in the certain area okay so i like that if there's some way to have some of those components on the truck, that's an awesome way to package these guys. Maybe put, instead of a pad, put the backboard there. That's fine. We don't like backboards, but if I've got to carry them three or four miles, I'd rather carry them on a backboard than you get this leg, you get this arm. It's a lot easier. Okay. So, salvage covers work pretty good for that off the fire engine. Yep. That's a great tip. All right. Here you go, Chief Ward. Patient number two, you've taken that patient to Rampart General. Now you're going to be dispatched to 501 6th Avenue North, male patient found unresponsive, lying next to a building. All right. You get there, he's agonal. He's got, un he's unresponsive agonal respirations, ambient temps about 22 degrees tonight. All right. That's all you got. Nobody's there. Somebody drove by, saw a body. They called. Okay. So it's cold. We don't know what happened, but the good thing is, the bad thing and the good thing is, it's cold. So if something happened, he's still got agonal respirations. There may be something there to work with. So this guy, he's agonal, very easily can devolve into cardiac arrest or cardiopulmonary arrest. So there's some special considerations when we talk about working with the, the cardiac arrest in a hypothermic patient. Again, they're neuroprotective. The, the cold air is going to help us out a lot. So this patient, if it's summertime, they've been down 30 minutes, they're down. They're done. There's really no way we're going to get that back. Well, if you've been down 20 or 30 minutes in a really cold environment, 
you possibly can get these guys back. Um, the longest survivable. Let me see how I'm gonna word this. There has been a recorded survivable six-hour resuscitation. The guy's core temperature was 13.7 degrees Celsius, which is 56 degrees Fahrenheit. No, yeah, 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And they did it. They worked him for six hours. He'd been down for a while. Came back neuro intact. Now, that's one person, but again, that's one person. So that's why we do this. Even if it's low chance, at least there is a chance. Okay. So this. I was a kid. Yeah. They came back and had some recovery neurologically as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it is useful. I will make this one st statement too. I've also seen uh, providers work someone who's hypothermic for too long. So if it's July in Alabama and they're cold, it's not environmental. It's that they're dead. So yeah. so that's that's a. The other end of the spectrum I've seen too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're not gonna get a warm at that point. So. Yeah, so what if you didn't hear Dr. Ferguson basically saying uh, check your temperature in the air. If it was a warm house, but that patient's cold, they're dead. If it's July and they're cold, they're they're dead. That's just that body has not perfused. So this is this only applies in very, very cold ambient temperatures. Now that's not just outside. You have a lot of poverty in Alabama, so you may go into a house that has no heat and they try to do it. But if it's and that's why if an if a doc asks you, well, what was it like in the house? That's literally all I'm looking for. Was it was it really cold or did you find the person and was it hot? I actually had a call the other day and that's exactly what we had was, hey, this guy's cold. This guy's dead. Well, it's 20 degrees outside, 25 degrees outside. But where was he? I was in his house, hot or cold. Oh, it was like 90 degrees in there. Okay, we're good. It's over. So, um, again, you get an increased window of survivability in these cold temperatures. Normal indicators of death. Big, big piece. Normal indicators of death are unreliable in cold ambient temperatures. So you found this guy. Let's say he wasn't agonal and he was just looked dead. Fixed dilated pupils are a natural hypothermic response. You're not going to get a lot of reaction on pupils when they're severely hypothermic. Apparent rigor mortis doesn't work here. It's cold. They're stiff. Um, even dependent lividity, which is kind of strange, your, your blood's still going to settle as the shunning process happens. So all the stuff that we would normally say, oh, this guy's dead, fixed pupil, dependent lividity, apparent rigor, where we'd normally call it in a warm environment, in a cold environment, it's not a contraindication to, to try to work this, okay? Um, we talked about the lowest core temperature ever that survived neurologically intact. But to go along with this, they ain't dead until they're warm and dead. You cannot be cold and dead in a cold environment, all right? So some little nuances that, that happen with ACLS-BLS. When you feel for a pulse, what's the normal ACLS-BLS protocol? 10 seconds, right? You don't feel those 10 seconds, you go. You start pumping on the heart. This actually is a minute. If you don't feel it in a minute, okay, now we start CPR. But you really need to feel for a minute. It's even better if you can put the leads on and see if there's an organized rhythm there. And the purpose of this is what we talked about earlier. When we move the patient, we don't want to jostle them and throw them into V-fib. Well, if there's a slow, slow bradycardic rhythm, that's at least something. I can work with it. But if I start pumping on their chest and throw them into V-fib, now we've got a problem. Okay, so feel for a pulse for up to a minute. And if you don't feel it in that minute, then okay, go. <clears throat> if the pulse is present, now we're focusing on respiratory support. They may be profoundly bradycardic, but now they're just not breathing well because the brain is so just uh, frozen, would be a good way to put it, that they're not breathing. So intubate or use a superglottic device here. Um, again, be very careful when you're just intubating or shoving stuff down. You want to be very gentle when you do it. Um, again, this is not something to rush. We've, we've got a little bit of time if they have the pulse. Okay. CPR, if the pulse is not present in that minute, because at that point, if I throw him into V-fib, so he doesn't have a pulse. Okay. Another really weird thing is no drugs are given if, if they're severely hypothermic. 
And until you know that their blood per, or the core temperature is 30 degrees or higher, which is about 82, it's not going to get to the heart. You're going to push it through a peripheral vein. It's not going to get there. So that's why on your state protocols it says call a doc about meds. Okay, and that's the whole point. It's just not going to get there. So until they're warm, there's no point of even pushing drugs at this point. All right, so we get them on the monitor. If it's an organized rhythm, even if you really can't feel the pulse, as you've probably got some time, okay? The, the rhythms we're worried about intervening on are V-fib. If it's PEA, again, I just, I gotta focus on rewarming, okay? So place on monitor, they can be profoundly bradycardic. If you do see V-fib, you get one shock, okay? A lot of studies have been done. There's no benefit to multiple, multiple, multiple shocks. Refractory V-fib gets this dual sequential D-fib. You get one shock if their core temperature is less than 30. So if you think they're super cold, they've been out there for hours at 20 degrees, they're probably less than 30 if they're arresting. So one shock at max power, so whatever your monitor is, you know, biphasic monitors are 200 or 360, max power. If that doesn't, if that's not successful, focus on rewarming, supportive care, and get them to the hospital the best you can, okay? Once they're over 30 degrees, now we'll start shocking them like regular, okay? All right, so the big takeaways, feel for a pulse for a minute, no drugs until they're warmer, and you get one shock if they're really, really cold at max power. All right, any questions on that? So to kind of go with what Chief Ward was saying, um, yes, you want to focus on compressions, but the new way of feeling is that heart is so irritable. If you can not do compressions, focus on airway and the supportive care and get them warmer so that all your interventions will be more successful. That, that okay way to say that? Yeah, I mean, if we, so that would be assuming they have a pulse and we just can't detect it. Correct. Because we got to, we got to perfuse the blood or mm -hmm. nothing else is going to matter. I agree. What about the, you know, we just got Lucas devices at mm -hmm. center point and a lot of the agencies in Jefferson yep. County and around the state. I wonder, I, I know it's probably no good data on it for mm -hmm. hypothermic patients because it's such a small patient population, but what are your thoughts about using the Lucas device? Uh, I'm a very big fan of Lucas all the way around. The only thing that I would say is, and it's just kind of dang if you do, dang if you don't, because if they don't have a pulse, you need to do something because again, nothing's nothing's going around. But you also have to be careful as we're for that after drop effect. As we're trying to perfuse these guys, the heart's irritable and I can throw them into V-fib, but also I'm going to start circulating really cold blood now. So if they're already at 24 degrees, I'm going to make them worse. But again, dang if you do, dang if you don't. I've got to try to save them, but I could potentially make things worse. So I'm a big fan of Lucas devices. I think if you don't have a pulse, I can put the Lucas on and I can carry them out and they can still get something going as I'm trying to get them warm as well. So, and I, you'll see when we talk about drownings in a minute, I think Lucas is an incredibly useful device. So these are the only true contraindications for resuscitation in a hypothermic cardiac arrest. If you see obvious fatal injuries, so things you'd be like, oh, he ain't coming back. Decapitation, he's got an open head injury with uh, exposed brain matter. Truncal transection, this is kind of an odd one, but have you seen and heard of the guys that fall out of a tree, but they're actually wearing their harness like they're supposed to? Well, they can cause a lot of problems there. Um, so, or if something cut them, then you can see an obvious wound that's just non-survivable. Incineration, which is kind of an odd one that I thought was weird in hypothermia patients, but yeah, if they're burnt, that's probably not gonna work. And then more importantly, if the chest wall is so stiff that you cannot physically compress them, so a frozen popsicle, there's no point in pushing. So, all right. Any questions on this? All right. So patient number three, we're gonna move on a little bit further. So we've talked about hypothermia. Now we got, you call it Highway 77 near Talladega Forest. I'm trying to use places that are close to us since, you know, I'm around here too. 
Highway 77 near the Talladega National Forest, you evaluate a hiker who's been found to be warning at a trailhead. So it's a 34-year-old patient alert, shivering profoundly, but and she's she's with it, um, but she's got bilateral foot pain and bilateral hand pain. Sorry, he. He states that he became lost while hiking alone yesterday. Temperatures 40, 50, but he's got really good clothing on. Um, he got out of the forest and somebody found him. Vital signs are stable. He actually looks good. So he may be stage one hypothermia because he's alert and he's still shivering. Okay. You get him to the warm environment, you take everything off. He didn't have gloves, but he did have good hiking boots. Now we can actually expose the patient to see what all we're dealing with. Again, vitals are normal except for mild tachypnea. ECGs, normal sinus rhythm, so we're not even in bradycardia at this point. And this is what you see. Hand, feet. Hand looks pretty stinking cold. Blue fingers. Um, on the underside, there may be a little bit of blistering there. And then the toes, you see a little bit of blistering starting to form. So, what do you think this patient's got? Close. I'm from Pell City. We just say frostbite. <laughs> you do. You do. Might have got colder last night. But yes, you do. So you're actually right. There is something called chillbane. Um, this is, we're going to say it's frostbite for really freezing temperatures. I was trying to throw a scenario where he looked okay, but his, his digits did not look okay. So on frostbite, the definition of frostbite is your skin and the underlying tissues are actually frozen. Um, you get vasoconstriction, and the more concerning thing is you get ice crystals that form within the tissues itself, within the dermis, within the skin, and in the muscles sometimes as well. That causes a lot of ischemia, tissue cell loss. So it's exactly the same as burn pathology. Just the burn is coming from very, very cold, okay? Um, there are a bunch of classifications, but the ones to know about are frost nip, which is not a true frost bite. It's just something where somebody has, their hands are painful, they're very red. Have you ever been outside and, I don't know, you play with the kids in the snow, but you don't have your gloves on. Well, your hands are red, they hurt. Then somebody, you try to catch something, your hands are about to fall off. That's technically frost nip. No actual freezing has occurred in your tissues, but you get profound vasoconstriction of that exposed skin, so it's, it's pretty stinking painful. What that really tells you, though, is now the conditions, so if you are hiking or whatever, if you see that, the conditions are there for frostbite. You need to protect your skin or you need to get out of that environment or you actually can develop pretty profound frostbite in those conditions. So frostbite, you got degrees just like you would on a burn. First degree, it's pretty superficial. You get some numbness, some, some redness or erythema. You might even see some thickening of the skin. So again, think of this like a burn. Second degree, now we're starting to get into blister formation. Third degree, we've actually got these really deep blisters that are starting to rupture with blood. And then fourth degree, you start getting into the muscle and the bone. Sounds just like burns, right? It's kind of red, first degree. Starting to get blisters, second degree. Third degree, really deep. Fourth degree, you've gotten in the bone, okay? It doesn't matter a lot for the pre-hospital setting. It's just good to know about it. And then when we get to the hospital, there's a different ways to rewarm them. So just a visual representation of where we are. So normal, these are our skin. Frost nip, if you can see, we're, we're only, these vessels are a little bit smaller and the skin is a little bit red. That's it. Once we're starting to get in the superficial frostbite, which is technically because there's blisters, that's a two. Now that we're really constricted on the vasculature, we don't get good perfusion of the skin, we're starting to get blister formation. And then deep frostbite, you're getting all the way through into the subcutaneous and muscular tissues. Okay. And then this is just another idea of, from some NBC affiliate, again, Dr. Google. Frost nip, it's irritating, it hurts. Your skin's going to be fine if you rewarm it. Superficial frostbite, you'll see blisters. And they may even appear after the rewarming process. Deep frostbite, your joints, bones, muscles, they may not work anymore until you get them rewarmed. So these are the super stiff, contracted. Those fingers are probably 
a deep frostbite. It's, I don't know if it's a three or a, a four yet, but they look pretty gnarly. All right. So management, that's the thing that we really concern ourselves with here um, is we're going to move the patient to a warm area. It's just like hypothermia. Patient goes to a warm area, all, the, all their jewelry and anything that could be constrictive comes off. Gloves, jewelry, everything comes off because these are going to swell, especially as we, we rewarm them. Okay. The big thing that we need to know in the pre-hospital setting is guard against refreezing. So if you've got a patient, they've got frostbite, you've got to get them out from a five mile hike in the woods, that's not the time that you want to start rewarming them at all because it actually causes more injury if you try to rewarm them, get stuck, it's still really cold and that tissue now refreezes. So now that second degree may have become a fourth degree and you're going to have a lot of tissue loss now. So if you can guard against refreezing, you're in the back of the ambulance, there's no chance of them getting cold again. Okay, we can start doing some things. We can basically put blankets around them that just being in that ambient environment is going to start to rewarm their tissue some. If you can't get to definitive care, so let's say you're skiing with buddies, you're lost in the wilderness, whatever, you make it to a cabin, but you can't get to a hospital for two hours or more. You can probably look at active rewarming. Again, this is not something I do in the pre-hospital setting. This is a dire emergency. But this is what we're going to do in the hospital. If I can guard against refreezing, now we're going to do active rewarming. And what that is, is we're going to basically take a water bath that's 99 to 102 degrees, and we're going to submerge that digit. It's going to hurt like crazy, and I'm going to keep that water warm. So once you submerge it, it's going to cool the water down. I've got to keep that same temperature, a steady temperature. They're going to stay there, okay? It's going to hurt, so we're going to give them pain medicines. What we don't want to do is we don't want them to rub the tissue to try to rewarm it. This is all either. This is all a passive process, okay? This is all, I get them in an ambient environment that's warmer. I can put some blankets lightly around them or I put them in a water bath. Never warm them like this and never warm them against the fire. So if you have frostbitten hands, you put your hands against the fire or near a fire, you're actually going to cause a thermal injury, I mean, a heat thermal injury in addition to that frostbite injury. The tissue is already super cold, so it's not going to, you don't have to get it to a super high degree to cause a burn, a heat burn. It's more susceptible to that now. So don't rub it. Don't warm them by the fire. Best thing to do, honestly, if you're stuck in the woods and there's no way to keep them warm, you got frostbite. Nothing I can do for you until we get you warm. Okay. Hey, Doc, we did have a question come in. This is, I think, more about hypothermia. Sure. Than might also interface over to a uh, frostbite, but it says, what are some good or recommended warming methods for non-transport units who are treating patients still exposed to low temps while awaiting a transport? For example, wool blanket versus full blanket versus head wraps versus heat packs, all the above. I honestly would do all the above. So the biggest things are get them out of their, if they're wet clothes, get them out of it. If their clothes are not wet, leave them in their clothes. Heat packs, the Mylar blanket, which is not fantastic, honestly, but it's better than what we have. It holds some of that heat in. You get some less radiated loss and then wrap everything up. So honestly, if you're in the field, you're a non-transporting unit, that burrito roll that we talked about is the best thing you can do. Yeah, one thing I would add to that is um, wool and polypropylene are the only two materials I know of that still will insulate when they're wet. Mm -hmm. But the wet doesn't really matter if they're completely encapsulated in something waterproof. Correct. You can still rewarm them when they're wet. Obviously, it's better yeah. to get the wet stuff off of them. But, but he's 100% right. So if there's no way to get wet off of them without further exposing the patient to some really big harm, you can throw them around the polypropylene or just plastic or even if the worst thing you have is bubble wrap. It's still going to hold the heat in and then you'll get some radiant heat which will warm that wet clothing as well. It's just going to take a little bit of time. So, yeah, good question. And I will start speeding up here. The, ne the next ones are, are actually pretty quick. So this is drowning. We're going to fly through this. You see a lot more of this in the summertime. The big thing we want to know about that this patient is a child, been gone under the water for 10 minutes, ambient temperature is 32 degrees. Okay. So, <clears throat> a lot of deaths that happen globally 
We still see about 3,500 in the U.S. Most of those, the vast, vast majority of those are definitely in the summertime with boating accidents and what have you. Um, disproportionately affects young victims. I'm not going to go over the definitions. But again, rescuer safety is your primary concern. Don't go in the water unless you're trained to go in the water is basically what I want to say about this. If you're not trained to go in the water, especially in a fast moving water like a river, don't go in. If you can see the, the victim, throw them a rope, grab them with a tree branch, paddle, whatever. But if you go in the water in fast moving water, you're not trained to, well, then you get lost. Now they've got to help two patients. Again, I want y'all to go home. I want everybody to get safe, but I want y'all to go home more than anything. Um, this is where we just want to go over very quickly. The main physiological insult in these people is cerebral hypoxia. So the resuscitation goal is a reversal to hypoxia. They can go into cardiac arrest, but if you don't fix the airway issue, it's a primary airway issue, that's, the, that's my, our goal. So prioritize airway and ventilation. Resuscitation of the drowning victim. Most drownings occur actually in colder water. Think about swimming in a swimming pool. 90 degrees is hot, but you can still get hypothermic in 85 degree water just because of, of heat loss and, and conduction. But again, it's cold outside. That patient is neuroprotective, so we have longer time. Manage hypothermia, but don't aggressively warm the patient until, unless the severe hypothermia is suspected. In this setting, this is where we deviate a little bit in the cold environment from regular ACLS, BLS. Compression only CPR is of little use in these patients. You know, we tell patients, lay, bystanders, lay people, hey, I know you don't want to put your mouth, that's do compressions. And it's better than nothing, but for us, we're going to prioritize that airway. Instead of CAB, we're definitely going to go A first on these people for sure. Okay. Um, if the airway is overlooked and you just start pumping and doing compressions, well, then the ongoing hypoxemia is going to lead to a really, really bad outcome in these folks because it was a primary airway problem, right? Okay. Again, I'm not saying not to do compressions at all. I'm just saying prioritize that airway in the whole process. Okay. Ventricular dysrhythmias are very rare in these drowning patients. It's usually a hypoxia issue. So you go from sinus attack to Brady to PEA and assistly. Hypoxia rarely leads. You can have it, but it's only about 10% of the time that you get a ventricular dysrhythmia in these people. So, again, focus on the airway. Heimlich maneuver is not going to be really recommended. I know you see the, the Baywatch stuff where they push a bunch of water out of their lungs. There's a lot of water in the lungs. <laughs> Sorry, that was a Ferguson thing. Oh, I would take C-spine precautions if you are concerned about a cervical injury, but actually the overall instance has been found to be pretty low. Um, again, if you don't know, take C-spine precaution, that's fine, especially if it's in a shallow pool. But if you're in a deep lake, you probably don't have a C-spine injury. That's just been a bunch of studies have shown that. So again, prioritize the airway. You get on scene, this kid gets you a tube, and then you're going to be in better shape. Okay. One thing I did want to mention there is real quick, I know we're running over. When you get your two, is if you talk two versus supraglottic, I know a lot of pre-hospital push has been for a supraglottic device. This is one instance I'm still going to advocate for a true ET tube. The whole purpose of that is if you've got a bunch of pulmonary edema, a bunch of fluid in the lungs, that supraglottic device is not going to give you as good a pressure, driving pressure as the ET tube will. So that's why if a superglottic is all you can get, okay, fine. But I would prefer you to get an ET tube. Now, don't stay on scene for 20 minutes mucking with the airway. Let's, let's treat the patient. But you actually need to have that driving pressure to push the air or to push the water away from the airways as much as you can. Um, so again, preferential airway. I prefer an ET tube if you're going to take a definitive airway. But that's my little two cents. And then this is another one. This is, we're going to go very fast because we're not going to ski. But you got a 35 year old lady from Pell City, Alabama, sea level. She goes to a ski resort up in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Well, now all of a sudden she's confused. She looks drunk. She could be, but looks drunk. She's not. 
She's actually experiencing altitude sickness. Altitude sickness usually occurs at 8,000 feet or more, but if you're coming from where we live, we're at, at sea level roughly. You know, our highest mountain's what, 3,000 3, feet? You know, y'all are closer to it than I am. Um, we're at high chance of having this. This is all due to lower oxygen levels at high altitude. You've got acute mountain sickness. You've got high, high altitude cerebral edema, which is bad. High altitude pulmonary edema, which is the worst. Okay. Acute mountain sickness, these are people who feel like they have a hangover. Basically, they have low oxygen levels. The brain's not happy. So they're going to have headache, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, anorexia. They're not sleeping very well. To prevent this, go stay somewhere before you go to up to that high altitude. Go somewhere that's higher than here, but not so high. So Jackson Hole is roughly about that, about eight to 10,000 feet, give or take. Go to Denver first. Denver is about 1,600 meters, but it's still high, but it's around 5,000 feet. You're still going to have slow, low oxygen, but it's not nearly as bad. Okay. You can take things like acetazolamide, which is a carbon, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Basically, it helps you get rid of some extra fluid so you don't have the swelling in the brain. Ibuprofen, what you do for hangover, ibuprofen. But if you are at altitude and this happens, just get lower. And it'll usually resolve pretty quickly when you go down a meter, a uh, thousand meters or so. High altitude cerebral edema is that next level. It's basically you have low oxygen, your brain swells because it's ticked off. And then this one's actually bad. You get super, super confused with this one. So you got the spectrum. Acute mountain sickness, it's a hangover. I don't feel good. Cerebral edema is, I'm profoundly confused. So these people are not one, if you're at altitude, you're on a ski slope, don't send them down by themselves. They'll get lost, they'll get crazy. They always go down and descend with somebody else, okay? And give them supplemental O2, because the air is low. HAPE is high altitude pulmonary edema. So same thing as when you have the uh, leaky vessels in the brain, same thing with this, low oxygen, causes vasoconstriction in the lungs. Now I have pulmonary hypertension that's flooding fluid out from the vasculature into the alveola. Same thing as this is honestly the same thing as CHF. Lungs are full of fluid. They're not going to breathe well. Okay. But this is one that actually kills people on a mountain. Okay. You can prevent it. Take all these things. The one that was kind of fun was Cialis. It opens the vasculature. So Take that for what it's worth. I'll let Ferguson make his jokes. I'm just saying. If uh, if you see somebody with Cialis on a ski trip, it's not necessarily that they're doing bad things. It's they may want to prevent this. So, But that was an interesting one. And then treatment is they've got to come down. You got to put them on O2 or put them on BiPAP or you put them in a Gamal bag, which is it's kind of neat, but it's also really confining. We have one at UAB just for our wilderness medicine department to show. You climb in it, it's a pressurized chamber. It's just like if you went and did a dive chamber at UAB or any of these wound care places. Same thing, it's just portable, okay? Animal bites, bad putty tat. We're not going to do much with these. It's local wound care. They need to go somewhere for potentially antibiotics, tetanus, um, as well as rabies. So that's a bobcat. We have them around here. They're mean. Their screams are scary. Yogi's a jerk. They'll actually do some bad damage. This Bambi fights back. Make sure they're dead when you go to pick them up. Pumba. These are nasty animals. I hate these things more than anything in the world. And then this is my life as an Auburn fan right now. <laughs> so, any questions? All right. Hey, thanks, Dr. Evans. That's a great lecture. Um, yeah, there's a lot more to, to dive into in environmental medicine, especially with the altitude and um, dive medicine. It's a great topic. We'll probably revisit again. Uh, but that was that was a great lecture. Thank you to Dr. Ferguson for your lecture. Everybody, please remember to fill out an attendance form. The link is in the question and answer chat box. Um, if you can't find that link or have problems with it, you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link to the attendance form. One attendance form per participant, please, and it will automatically generate an email certificate for you. And we will be back. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, what's our next date in January? 
be the second Wednesday in January. Looks like it'll be the 13th, if I'm looking at my calendar correctly. Correct. We'll be at Center Point, and then on January the 27th, we'll be down in Foley, Foley Alabama, visiting the good folks down there. So if you have a chance, come and visit us. Thanks, everybody, for participating. That's all we've got today.